causal chain are what preserves human freedom and breaks the bonds of fate. The swerve allows man to be responsible for his actions. I'll let you guys start reading that while I take a brief. So even with that, even with the swerve, there really is still no choice. It's just whatever happened was because something swerved. What Epicurus is doing is saying that the only way human beings have an ability to impact their fate is if there is non-causality in existence. That's really what he's saying. But even that has a cause. Well, yes. In a sense. Right. Which is I mean, why we never... Which is what he's trying to... Which is really what he's saying. It's like, it's, you, you just said, those swerves it, is what introduces the ability for us to be able to impact, you know, have an impact or ultimately a choice. Right. But, but it still comes back to, well, I still didn't really have a choice. My choice only existed because of that swerve that happened, and what was which the, is no choice. What was the point earlier? Compatibilism. Ultimately, right. we see, we're seeing the early versions of this very thing. You have indeterminism and compatibilism together. We have, it is ultimately still determined. And the thing that potentially makes us free is this thing that really doesn't make us free. Hence, the discussion of determinism remains fundamentally unintelligible. Well, you'll see. We'll, we'll keep going here. And it gets worse, <coughs> trust me. <laughs> uh, letter from Epicurus. Letter, and I do not think I can pronounce this right. Minosius? Sounds good. Yeah, okay, good. Tooling or like that? To virgin. No, yeah, no. Tulian Tavijan. Tavijan. Is that how Harry? Tavijan. Yeah. Is it Tavijan? Is it Tavijan? Is it Tavijan? Now you can pronounce anything. Right. Okay. So give that a try again. Tulian Tavijan. Tavijan. I've got Minosius here, so since I haven't been peer reviewed, it's possible that I'm pronouncing that wrong. We'll go with that. Sounds right. Yeah. Sounds right. Okay. Uh, okay, so here's Epicurus talking. He's speaking of a wise and virtuous man. Fate, which some introduce as sovereign over all things, he scorns. Now, this being the wise man. Affirming rather that some things happen of necessity, others by chance, <coughs> others through their own agency. For he sees that necessity destroys responsibility and that chance is inconsistent, whereas our actions are autonomous. And it is then that praise and blame naturally attach. It were better indeed to accept the legends of the gods than to bow beneath the yoke of destiny, which the natural philosophers have imposed. The one holds out some faint hope that we may escape if we honor the gods, while the necessity of the naturalists is deaf to all entreaties. Nor does he hold chance to be a god, <clears throat> as the word as the world in general does. For in the acts of, the go of a God there is no disorder, nor to be a cause, though an uncertain one. For he believes that no good or evil is dispensed by chance to men, so as to make himself blessed. Though it supplies the starting point of great good and great evil, he believes that the misfortune of the wise is better than prosperity of the fool. It is better, in short, that what is well judged in action should not owe its successful issue to the aid of chance. I want you to notice how hard man starts to resist the premise that his determined action makes him morally responsible. Man implicitly understands that this is a fundamental injustice. He implicitly understands that if his actions are determined, whether by the naturalists or the gods, it either absolves man of a moral action, or man is now, he actually has no ability to achieve anything in his own right. He rejects this, but this is actually what not, is not what dominates. Even though he is trying to make an, an, an effort at philosophical justification for free will, he of course falls short. He cannot divorce the two. <clears throat> It does not solve the problem of necessity. It's not even close. At a minimum, it raises these questions. Since swerves are random, how do these explain free action? 
which is effectively what you were saying. How does a four ultimately explain free action? What does it mean? What does does that mean atoms randomly swerve before every free action? How can free action happen with regularity? As predicated on human moral choice, effectively you would have to have a swerve at the encounter of every moral choice in human existence. Where do you get that? And then, because if it happens and if swerves happen frequently, how come then stones and trees and other inanimate objects, why can't they suddenly start doing free action? Of course, since this did not solve the problem, the next people to come up were called the Stoics. Introducing chance into existence is really the same as introducing non-causality into existence. And the moment we introduce non-causality, suddenly the three year and five year old question of why suddenly becomes, uh, I don't know. The reason we can answer the question why is because ultimately we can identify the causal chain so we can actually dissect it such that the five year old can understand the relationship between A, B, C, and D. The moment we say non-causality, then A doesn't necessarily follow B and we're back to an unintelligible Heraclitus, everything is flux and change world. The, the Stoics rejected the premise, uh, rejected of course what um, Epicurus tried to introduce, and we have a guy by the name of Chrysippus. Again, don't know these Greek names, but we'll go with it. Um, huh? Crispy chicken, is that what you just said? No, oh, shoot. <laughs> Chris, Chrysippus. Chrysippus. Uh, yeah, okay. Crispy Good. chicken. We'll go with that. Crispy chicken, that's cute. All right. Everything that happens is followed by something else which depends on it by causal necessity. Likewise, everything that happens is predicated by something with which it is causally connected. For nothing exists or has come into being in the cosmos without a cause. The universe will be disrupted and disintegrated into pieces and cease to be a unity functioning as a single system if any uncaused movement is introduced into it. Brief editorial note. For those of you thinking about neo-Calvinists, where have you heard that logic before? I believe it's John Piper that says, if God's not in control of just about everything, if he's not in control of everything, if he's in control, in control of not one atom, it all destroyed, right? R.J. Sproul. Is that Sproul? Yeah, R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul? Yeah. You see where he gets it? Mm -hmm. There really is nothing new under the sun. The Stoic solution was, natural law controls everything. Every event has a cause, and that cause necessitates the event. Even exactly the same, given the exact same circumstance, exactly the same result occurs. Now, I want you to understand something here. If that isn't true, we have no modern science. Given the same set of circumstance, the same factors, the exact same result occurs. This is the basis of, of, of modern science. And it is our ability to identify all the factors that determine all the relationships that ultimately produce the same action and the same outcome. This is, Sir Fran this is what Francis Bacon 101. And it was this ability to understand this that made what we do in the modern world possible. The central issue here is, is they apply this ultimately to human action. Human beings are just as determined, just like Democritus already told us, this is really what human beings, this is the lot of the human existence. So, if, uh, <coughs> if I may, um, coming into play here is the obvious fact that man has shown himself able to identify elements and manipulate them. Correct. And make them uh, work, to work together, work together to bring about cause and effect results. Yep. Okay, so in helping me keep up with this, 
where what's the direct contrast in your words to the prior? Um, what these other guys are saying, uh, natural <coughs> naturalists, um, yeah, naturalists, so on and so forth. Um, well, okay, hold that. I want you to keep that thought in mind because what you just said ultimately is Sir Francis Bacon's premise: okay. nature to be commanded is to be obeyed. Man does not, when he interacts with the world, he does not bring anything into existence, he merely rearranges what is to his own advantage. This is a modern concept. We don't get, see my timeline here? We don't get to where you're going until this direction. Man has to learn some things before this happens. As of right this minute, everybody pretty much prior to here has said man has no ability to impact the world. Or his ability to impact the world is very narrow. Does that help you? Well, yeah, up in what you're saying during this time, there's no ability to impact the world. Correct. Now, I haven't, uh, trust me, we'll get to rebuttals and where I think we fit and how right. I think this works later. Okay. Okay? <coughs> okay, so, the Stoics. Now, I do want you to keep this in mind, and I made this point, and I just stepped out of camera, or did I? No, I'm a shadow. Um, Stoicism. Here, remember, this is the world in which Christianity expands. Keep this in mind because it matters when we're coming up, what's coming up next. <clears throat> okay, so we have them, they have, they've successfully identified <clears throat> that given the exact same circumstance, exactly the same results will occur. This is a part, good thing, but man is still respons morally responsible no matter what. Chrysippus, 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 Crispy chicken. <laughs> I just feel like I stepped back into kindergarten. Uh, <laughs> Chrysippus is our first compatibilist. You remember from my definitions, compatibilist. Determinism exists, but man is still morally culpable. Determinism exists, man is still morally culpable. Keep this in your head because it actually becomes very important here in a minute. Um, the central issue, morality and determinism. And I, did I give this? I don't remember if I actually quoted this one. It is just as if you throw a cylindrical stone across. Is this actually a repeat of? No, this is actually, this is not it. Um, it's just as if you throw a cylindrical stone across a region of ground, which is sloping and steep. You were the cause in the beginning of the headlong fall for it. But as soon as it rolls headlong, not because you are now bringing it about, but because that is how its fashion and capacity for rolling in its shape are. Just so the order and rule and necessity of fate sets types and beginnings of causes in motion, but the impulse of our minds and the deliberations and our actions themselves are governed by each person, each person's will and by the nature of our minds, and men suffer woes that they choose themselves. This is a reiteration of what I just said. This is, a, this is his words on how he addresses the issue. Determinism exists, fates set things in motion, but man is responsible for the content of how he acts in context of the fates. So the Stoic metaphysic is complete determinism. The logic is, the Stoic logic is, fate equals nature equals natural law equals God. Now I want you to understand, the Stoics are advancing one of the first real mystical versions of determinism. Nature, natural law, is really God in their minds. Up until now, it's been mostly agnostic. It's been uh, Western or, um, Greek culture, while they believed in the gods, they were not theocrats. Their philosophy was born, it's effectively man, primarily man-centered, secular, if you will. The Stoic logic is effectively the first advancement of a theological version of determinism in a formal sense. Everything is governed by fate. Fate equals nature, nature equals natural law, and that equals God. They, identif they uh, <coughs> identified with the sequences of causes. Nothing could happen otherwise than it does in any given set of circumstance. One and only one result can follow. 
The past is unchangeable, but possible future events do not occur by necessity from past external factors alone. Factors shaping events also include man's action. We have a choice to assent or not to assent to an action. Man's actions, pardon me, man's actions are determined by the nature of our character. And, um, three more pages. I'm almost, I'm, I'm almost close. I'm almost close. Told you I was going to try to play nice this year. <laughs> we, <laughs> man's actions are determined by the nature of our character and fated because of divine foreknowledge. But future events are not necessitated, i.e. predetermined by the past. Okay. <clears throat> Just to kind of put things in, in context here, mm -hmm. going back to my stu our study of the book of Acts, because you, you're getting into here into the Christianity mm -hmm. Greek world, these were the exact same people that Paul encountered. These in the are the exact same people on Mars Hill. Exactly. Because from and from my own study and preparing that particular lesson from chapter seventeen, I think it was. Epicurean thought had dominated culture for the majority was the dominant thinking for for a long a, a length of time. Yes. And the Stoics were trying to make inroads into that. And so Paul steps right into the middle of this conflict between the Epicureans and the Stoics. Mm -hmm. And they want to hear what he has to say about it, and mm -hmm. he turns them both upside down. Mm -hmm. What Andy is actually, the Andy's comment fits exactly into this timeline, and this is what I want you to see. Nothing happens in a vacuum. Uh, Christianity has a tendency to believe that it was born out of a plot, kind of came out fully formed on the side of God's head and landed in men's minds. This is just not true. I want you to understand, I'm going to step out of camera range again, I'll use the pointer. Okay, <clears throat> the Pythagoreans, remember what I said they were known for, what was it? Pop quiz, soul body dichotomy, yes? The division of man's material existence with his spiritual existence, yes? Okay, now, <clears throat> We have a resurgent sophistic movement, a resurgent cynic movement, and a resurgent Pythagorean movement. All of these are occurring right around the time we have the rise of Christianity. And what Andy just said is exactly right. When Paul shows up on Mars Hill, and in fact, it wouldn't have mattered if it was Mars Hill or the local streets in Jerusalem. Ultimately, ultimately, Paul intellectually had to compete with these dominant worldviews. And Paul would not have been anywhere close to the, the intellectual mainstream, not even close. He actually has <clears throat> some cynic influence in his doctrine and his uh, sophic uh, ideas in his doctrine. Whether it was, whether, whatever you want to do with that, I'll let you decide. But ultimately, this is, this is the world in which Christianity begins to emerge. I discussed this at length in my um, 2013 lectures. You remember... You remember that by the second century, Plato, Aristotle have faded. Uh, the dominant philosophical thought throughout the Western world is the Stoics, the Cynics, and the Skeptics. I didn't put the Epicureans in here, but uh, Andy is correct. So we have these resurgent movements right around the time of Jesus, right here. <clears throat> remember, the physical body is corrupt, and the material world is corrupt. This is the Pythagorean influence. The denial of the flesh is an existential ideal. The physical body prevents man from taking moral action, asceticism, meaning the flesh destru destruction of the flesh is a virtue, beating yourself, starving yourself, don't take a bath, that kind of thing. The cynic and stoic ascetic ideal has become the Christian ideal. This is what happens through this time period and coming forward. The ascetic ideal becomes the Christian ideal. And that is specifically and directly cynic and stoic. <clears throat> the soul, the spiritual, and the otherworldly is good. 
Man's fleshly world existence is evil. Man has no ability to change. So now we see, effectively, this has started to metastasize. Right here. What was a mystical version of determinism starts to metastasize, and the gap between man's physical existence and his spiritual existence grows wider and wider and wider and increasingly more hostile. This is the background. This is the backdrop. And I'm going to use these next two men. Lucian of St. Lysota and Alexander of Aphrodisius. I wanted to put these two guys in here because I wanted you to see a contrast. And these are not Christian thinkers. We are, we are in, this is 120 to 210 AD, okay? This is in this area right, right through here, okay? These are not Christian thinkers. This is not the dominant world view. But these are pagans, if you will, who are still struggling with the dominant thought that I'm showing you here. And here's what they had to say. Lucian of San Masada. Um, this is actually a, uh, an entire discussion, and I just pulled one section out of it. This is actually on spiritualtyranny.com. That's my blog. I didn't introduce that at the beginning. But I do run a blog, spiritualtyranny.com. I talk about this stuff at some length. I posted Zeus Catechized um, online because I wanted people to see it in its total context. Um, and so here's what, uh, here's what he had to say. Now, Lucian, he's a... He's not, I'm not sure it's even right to call him a philosopher, but he's a thinker of his day, and he's a social commentator, and so he has written this, effectively, this play. And Siniscus is talking to Zeus. And he says, why we men do nothing of our own free will. We are obeying an irresistible impulse. That is, if there is any truth in what we settled just now, settled just now, about fates being the cause of everything, does a man commit murder? Fate is the murderess. Does he rob a temple? Ha he has her instructions to do it. So if there is going to be any justice in M Minos, in Minos's sentence, he will punish destiny, not Sis that person, Sisyphus. 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 He will push desti punish destiny, not Sisyphus. Sis, for heaven's sake, Sisyphus. Fate, not Tantalus. What harm do these men do? They only obey orders. Notice, and again, I want to reiterate, he is a non-Christian and in the early age of Christianity. Even the pagans see the crucial failing of the deterministic metaphysic. Determinism makes a mockery of justice. And here is Alexander of Aphrodisius. I don't think I actually have anything for him. Uh, he also wrote during this time period, his purpose was to attack the Stoics' strict determinism. The Stoic worldview was encompassed by a materialist cosmology, the atomists, governed by the god of nature. Nature's god had foreknowledge of all causal chains and as such predetermined the whole of human action. Alexander said that fate was nature and that nature only held, held power over species. Notice he is trying to remove the mystical power from nature. He's trying to make a, uh, he's trying to divide it. As such, nature cannot have foreknowledge. <clears throat> uh, I don't know Greek, but it is my understanding that the Greeks do not have a word for free will. Um, I know, Andy, you like Greek roots, so is that true? Do you I know? know? Yeah, it's my understanding they don't have a word for free will specifically. What they use, there is a word that means that is translated, what depends on us. And this becomes, what depends on us is a choice between alternatives. Alexander is arguing that man is responsible for self-caused decisions and can choose what actions to take. <clears throat> the question then becomes, in the issue in the history of determinism, what depends on man? Now, as you can see, we are poised in my big movement, in my big chart here. We are about ready to discuss these three right here. Mm -hmm. Well, Augustine, and in conjunction to Plotinus. Oh, I'm sorry. What'd you say? I boo-hissed Augustine. You boo-hissed Augustine. Yeah, you should. It only gets darker from here. 
Um, and we are, I did good. I did good. I think. What time is it? Almost 12. 15 minutes over. Okay, well, <clears throat> thoughts, comments, knock knock jokes, what? Uh, I. I It takes time for me to digest these philosophical ideas. It's because it's almost a circuitous argument here. It, it's like in circles sometimes, <laughs> a lot of time. But um, in all my reading of uh, Jonathan Edwards, um, and all the hours that he spent in study, he was not spending that time studying the Bible. He was very knowledgeable in these philosophers. Mm -hmm. And the more you talk, the more I see that man yep. and how he picked and plucked and formed and molded mm -hmm. doctrine mm -hmm. for the church yes. from these philosophers. Yes, they did. And claimed that they were directly from God. Correct. And that they were to be obeyed. Yes. This is um, one of the reasons that I make such an effort to show you the progression of thought. One of the reasons that Paul and myself and others who take on this stuff have such a hard time is because most people fail to grasp that Christianity did not show up fully formed in the world. Its roots, Christianity, forgive me for being so blunt, has been masterful at pretty much taking whatever it wants from whatever tradition it wants. You talk about Christianity as we know it today. Yes, Christianity as we know it today. We'll plagiarize whatever it wants for any reason it wants and turn it into a sanctified doctrine. And I'm trying to rip the mask off of that. I'm trying to show you that this stuff did not show up fully formed out of whole cloth, out of the side of the God's head and dumped in our heads. It's just not how that worked. It has very serious roots going all the way back to the beginnings of Western thought. And Christianity as we know it gets, this is my first major historical villain. The fact that he is considered a saint is an atrocity. It's an intellectual atrocity. That's, uh, that's the reason why I assert that we drop, we, we need to drop the term Christianity. Because what we know as Christianity today is not what you've got there in the green box there, Christianity expands into the Greek world. That is not what that is not what Jesus introduced into the world following his crucifixion mm -hmm. when those 120 disciples left that upper room after the Holy Spirit descended upon them and they went out. That is not what Jesus had in mind. I would agree, but the philosophical development See, here's what never happened in Christianity, and I've said this before. Here's what never happened. There was no philosophical, what happened in the upper room had no philosophical standpoint. It could not succeed, it could not prevail in this environment because it cannot answer, it cannot rebut these issues. One of the reasons that Paul had such a hard time on Mars Hill is because he didn't have, he didn't have a framework within, to put, within which to put this. What happens day of Pentecost here has no ability to compete with what happens here. By the time we get to the patristics, which is 70, 80 years after, after Jesus, the church fathers, what are known as the church fathers, are already confronted with an, an onslaught of Hellenistic thought. Mm -hmm. And they did not have a means or an ability to do this. A generalized house-to-house -house movement, this is one of the biggest problems behind the whole house-to-house -house movement. It has no framework, which is why universally, what happens is, is that, that revivals go, okay, we got this thing kind of going, but now what does this all mean? And they need a framework, and so they start looking back here. I don't know that that would necessarily be, that I would necessarily fault Paul for that. I don't think that he was necessarily, I don't think the, the fault lies with him not necessarily having a philosophical framework. I think it goes back to I think there's other motivate there's another motivation behind it. Paul was simply saying, look, here is how here is how what Jesus says 
fits into reality, but these guys were looking <laughs> at a different reality. Well, and, there no. was, and there was mother, and because of that, there was other motivations behind it, whether it be power, influence, authority, whatever. They weren't willing to, they wanted to hang on to whatever they had, and so they had a philosophical framework that supported what they wanted, and the reason they butt heads with Paul is because they were coming from, Paul was saying this, and these guys were saying, well, Paul, what you might be saying might not necessarily be true, but we reject it because it doesn't fit in with what we want. Well, for the our first, I will say this, for the first hundred, I want to say for the first hundred and ten years or so, Paul was considered a heretic. Paul doesn't make it into canon. This is very ironic. I think it was a guy by the name of, I can't think of his name. Because there were Who several Who was the first guys? guy to actually suggest a canon? It had, he hits about 150, 160, 80. I can't think of his name. He's ultimately condemned. He was condemned as a heretic. But he was the first person to bring Paul into canon. What you see happening on Mars Hill, though, is after their discussion, after most of those guys dismiss Paul as a lunatic, Paul walks away, but there are several who come to him mm -hmm. afterwards and said, hey, we like what you had to say. In fact, we're actually, we are convinced with what you have to say. Mm -hmm. But they say it to him in secret because they don't want to be seen with him because they know if they do, they're going to be ostracized. Sure. So Paul presented a reasonable, convincing argument that there were those who believed him and followed after him. The ones who did not, those who were not reasonably convinced, were not so because it did not fit in with their premise. Well, it didn't actually, this right here, Paul, what Paul had to say did not answer any of these primary thinkers. That was the, that was the substantive problem. And of course, this is, this is why Christianity, for the most part, flounders through this time period. It doesn't have the ability to impact the larger world philosophically. So by the time we get to Augustine, the church is in full tilt boogie trying to find a framework within which that it can. And ultimately what it does is Augustine co-ops Plato. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, in, in all of these constructs, I don't see a whole lot of difference between Plato's idea of... Um, immutable forms, okay, versus the shadow world. You still have that dichotomy of all material is evil and only the invisible is good. Correct. With the assumption that all that is invisible is immutable, by the way, right? Right, right. right. Okay, now, Plato assumed, now I don't know if Plato put the invisibility in there and put the put the uh, the pure forms together with that that was invisible. I'm not sure about that. You probably know more about that than well, I do. Well that's the central premise behind idealism in general. Uh -huh. That this this mystical spiritual world is the is the location of creation and we somehow get this this shadow thing down here. Yeah. Um, but Obviously, though, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, the pushback in that is the idea that atoms being invisible, if they're, you know, you have all of this different kinds of interactions going, obviously atoms are mutable, okay? Um, you know, how does that fit into Plato? I don't know that it does. Okay. I don't know that it does. Actually, we're unfortunately we've got a. Your question really, there's nothing back in this direction that answers that. Okay. We've got to get we've got to get to the enlightenment before we ever come close to being able to address what that means. So, any other comments, thoughts? You guys, hungry? Mm -hmm. We are. I'll do a uh, quick overview of what we've got coming over ne coming up next and uh, we are gonna we are gonna eat and, drink uh, and be merry right? <laughs> eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die Sleep death yeah and uh, so yeah we're gonna break for lunch we'll be back 
at, uh, I believe we have to be back by one because we got a link set up. So we'll be closing out the Google group uh, live broadcast for the morning session. Um, we do have some folks that requested to be a part of uh, uh, the afternoon session, probably because John made them mad. And uh, so no. it was during John's session we got at least one email. Sign me up, sign me up. Yeah, so, uh, so we might have some participation there in the afternoon. And um, so uh, with that, we'll break for lunch and we have to be back uh, by one because we do have the link set up for um, people joining us uh, on Google Hangouts. And with that, we'll uh, break. Uh,